let the code do the talking. <laughs> do you feel to be part of the cypherpunk movement? So when you, before you said it like, uh, what was your motivation for developing PGP and about whether it's important to write code? So maybe that's a better lead. Yeah, uh, well, I, um, I, I was very interested in privacy and civil liberties. And I saw that cryptography was a very political technology that would have a lot of relevance to the question of preserving privacy and civil liberties. Um, that if you want to organize politically in a hostile political environment, it's, it's a good idea if you can do that uh, without being surveilled by uh, an oppressive government. I wasn't thinking only of the United States. Um, now, during the course of my criminal investigation for exporting PGP, I had to talk as if I was only interested in domestic use of, of this cryptography of PGP. Uh, because um, because I was, they were trying to get me to show that I was intending to export PGP, and so I couldn't say the quiet part out loud. But the fact is that I did want it to be exported, and I did want it to be used around the world in autocratic regimes uh, by the people to defend themselves against these autocratic regimes. Um, and I and I didn't. And I didn't really think of this in a context of cypherpunks because cypherpunks were libertarian and anarchists, and I I was neither of those. Um, I was I was, felt an affinity to human rights workers, and I what I saw PGP as a human rights project. And and so uh, of course we can use it domestically also to have grassroots political organizations defending themselves from governments that are you know strongly against what they're doing. So I felt that there was a political need for PGP. It was only years later, after the criminal investigation was over, that PGP uh, turned into a commercial product. So its first mission was not a commercial mission, but was rather, um, it, it had to stand up to attacks from um, the NSA and the K KGB and, and um, you know, uh, Governments that had powerful um, resources to, you know, to break encryption, and and so um, maybe I'm going on too long here <laughs> with one answer. Phil, what is PGP? Uh, PGP is uh, is email encryption software. It encrypts files and, and encrypts email, and. Um, and it became the most widely used email encryption software in the world. Um, it started out as an open source project. It was a human rights project. And um, it spread all around the world rapidly. And because of the spreading around the world, uh, it violated the Arms Export Control Act. And, and I got in trouble for it. Adam, how and why did you become interested in these topics? Yeah, actually, I mean, I uh, found the Cypherpunks list by first being aware of PGP and becoming interested in PGP. So that's that actually my entry point. And my, my uh, thought process w was I knew about RSA because there was a master's student, a friend of mine at university, who was implementing it on parallel computers to make it faster. So when PGP came out, it's all over the te technology news. Very interesting because of the reasons that Phil mentioned that, you know, it, it changes the balance of power potentially between, you know, activists and, a, and an oppressive government, or you know, protesters, or so on in in dem democracies too. And typically, the the more oppressive countries are more likely to have outright bans on encryption or on you know today on like social media platforms and things like that. But at the time, the U.S. had just kind of anomaly almost it felt like of an export regulation for cryptography, for encryption, that, data back, that, that was really connected with arms export, like missiles and you know, not, not just you know, guns that a person could buy, but military grade weapons. And in, in that set of regulations was encryption, including like open source, uh, you know, individual or community developed software. So I think from what I understood, Phil didn't, didn't know or expect this to be a problem that he'd you know, release this software because it's kind of an obscure and surprising regulation. But, you know, one of the people, so obviously 
after, after PGP was released, it struck me as extremely interesting. You know, that there was a piece of software, you know, I was a computer science student, so I was interested in mathematics and software, and the idea that public key cryptography could do all these things, I was a little bit familiar with because of my friend's, you know, uh, master's project, but PGP put it together and it, it gained worldwide attention, right? That this is a sort of combination of technology and mathematics and, you know, a bonus for sort of the empowerment of the individual, like self-sovereignty, ability to protect your rights. And the, and the interesting thing is you typically would have those rights according to regulations and law in many places, but they were, they were being eroded by the fabric of the internet, you know, the ISPs logging things and things like that. So I got super interested in this. And so I thought, well, you know, there must be a people online talking about this. Where is the discussion forum where people are talking about PGP and things like it? And that's where I found the cypherpunks. And so one of the, you know, active cypherpunks was Hal Finney. And coincidentally, there's some like overlap between the cypherpunks and people in the sort of human rights and privacy, uh, which is Hal Finney had a kind of foot in both camps. And he was actually a coder, uh, one of the early contributors to the Bitcoin, to the PGP source code, actually. And one of the things he did, which was a kind of an application or use of PGP as a tool, was there was a system called Remailers, which was to provide privacy for email. And the early ones weren't very good because they weren't encrypted. So anybody, you know, any national, uh, you know, national security agency type of thing could, you know, just watch the emails flowing around and figure out who was sending what, right? So Hal added PGP to it in a, in a kind of onion, right? So the first person would encrypt it and it would go to a remailer and then it would decrypt it and find out where to send it next. And so if you were just eavesdropping part of it or you had visibility into one of the remailers, you wouldn't necessarily know who it was from or who it was to. So there's a kind of uh, overlap technology. And, and the cypherpunks were interested in other applications of encryption like uh, Tor, like, uh, but this was a bit before Tor was created, and electronic cash. That was what they were consider the holy grail, and but it was also extremely challenging. Do you think there is anyone nowadays with the same motivations as you who is facing these challenges? I think we have a lot of tools available to us today. Um, we're not short on tools. Um, there's lots of really good protocols today. I mean, the Signal protocol is a great protocol. Uh, we have VPNs. We have, uh, uh, you know, WireGuard is a particularly well-designed version of a VPN. Uh, SSH has been around for a very long time. Uh, that's for remote administration of servers. Uh, there's TLS is absolutely ubiquitous. Every web browser uses TLS to connect to a server. And also TLS is used by uh, mail clients talking to the mail server. So in addition to whether or not it may or may not use PGP to encrypt the, the contents, the mail, there's a tunnel connecting the mail client to the server, and that tunnel is run by the TLS protocol. There's also IoT devices. IoT devices either are so badly designed they don't use any encryption, or if they use any encryption, it's likely to be TLS. So it'll connect this little device to a server, and it's doing it through TLS. So there are ubiquitous strong encryption tools available to us. There's lots of well-designed protocols that are well designed for their particular niche application. Um, and so we have plenty of those, I, I think. I mean, there's always you know, a need to do more stuff for more special cases. But I think that, that we have lots of tools. But, what, but, I, but there is an area that we do need to work on, and it's not just software development, is it, it is working in policy space. We're seeing the pushback right now from uh, the five eyes, from the U.S., the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, and actually a couple of other countries. Uh, I think Japan and India have been pushing back against end-to-end -end encryption. And um, they're 20 years too late. We, you know, we took care of this debate, we thought, 20 years ago, in 2000. Uh, more than 20 years ago. And so uh, we thought that was the end of it, but apparently it's not the end of it. 
And so they're pushing back. And I think the reason why they're pushing back against end-to-end encryption in particular, I mean, they don't seem to be pushing back against TLS. So if you're using a web browser to talk to your bank, uh, you're going through TLS, and they don't seem to care about that. They can always ask the bank to hand over all the information about you. What they care about is end-to-end. And the re- I think the reason why they care about that is because uh, some years ago, um, the signal protocol was used in WhatsApp. And the, overnight, it became available to more than a billion people. And today, it's like two billion. And so I think that that caught law enforcement by surprise. They, they weren't seeing large-scale use by criminals for encryption. Only the smart criminals would use encryption. But now... Lots of people who have no knowledge of cryptography can just speak effortlessly with WhatsApp. And this, I think, has been a precipitating uh, event for law enforcement to say, we've got to push back against end-to-end encryption. So we have to push back against them pushing back. I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, the 1990s, uh, they've forgotten history and they're trying again. And, you know, I mean, it, originally I think this was combined by a combination of building and deploying technology, which is why the cypherpunks like to say write code with the idea that, you know, if somebody would implement something and, you know, clearly Phil got there with the email encryption adoption, right, that society would adopt it. And then after they were used to using it, in a widespread way, it'd be more difficult for governments to say, well, can you give back, you know, your favorite chat app or, you know, your SSL connection? And we don't want that anymore. It's much harder for people to ban things if they're widely used. But um, I think a lot of people in the cypherpunks viewpoint are not interested in talking about policy. So they just think, well, we'll just keep using it or people will use it and somebody else will take care of the policy. But as Phil says, you know, ignoring policy can be risky because a policy engine, you know, the people driving the policy are like a small segment of society. It's like people in law enforcement whose job, is, you know, whose day job is to, you know, deal with murders and crimes, which is, you know, 0.1% or less of society. And in their little sort of, you know, the dark area of the world that they have to operate in, they're looking for to make the, the job easier. And the problem is, if you do that, you know, if you let them have what they want, it has implications for the other 99%, 99.9% of people that are far more expensive and potentially risky to society as a whole. You know, if you allow centralized organizations to build up dossiers and there's a political change, that could be extremely dangerous to populations. And that's repeated, you know, throughout history, right? That, you know, an invading force will, you know, seize the government registries and figure out, you know, who has money, who has property. So building up these sort of pervasive eavesdropping and dossiers and it presents a risk for the fu- future freedom, right? So I think we just need to remind these people who are ultimately public servants, right? We employ them to help keep society safe, that there's a balance that society wants and they should respect that balance. But, but to convey that message, it, basically the mechanism, the crude mechanism is voting, but that's too indirect. So the, the uh, more focused way is to, you know, work with organizations, I guess, like the EFF and, you know, people that are looking for civil liberties and to make sure that policymakers hear those perspectives because they are actually representing 99.9% of society. Uh, You know, I I had a friend named Brian Snow uh, who was the senior cryptographer at NSA. NSA has uh, two broad areas. Uh, One side, it does the signals intelligence, the intercepts and uh, crypt analysis. And the other side of NSA does the uh, how do we protect American communication against foreign adversaries? And he worked in the latter part. And he, he, you know, he often complained that the other side had more budget and more resources than his side. Um, and he felt that um, that the FBI's insistence on on backdoors um, was was misplaced. That that it was not in the interest of national security to let the FBI have what they want. He he said that he would get in arguments with them saying, look, you know, you, you're, tr- you're trying to focus on your mission, law enforcement, but it's not the only mission. You know, we also have national security considerations and we have to protect 
U.S. communications, not just government ministries, but also uh, defense contractors or anybody who talks to the government or the whole of society or our financial system or, uh, you know, all kinds of places that could be attacked and infiltrated. Our, our electric grid structure, um, we need strong cryptography for that. And, and your focus on back doors is, is not in the interest of the rest of society. And that was Brian Snow's dialogue with, with his counterparts in, in the other side of NSA. And um, he retired many years ago. He, I, just a, he retired just a few years after 9-11, I, and maybe because NSA was moving in directions that he didn't like. And um, he died, I think, last year. And uh, I always uh, thought that he was more of a kindred, kindred spirit with uh, a lot of us who were on the outside um, trying to do essentially what he was trying to do, which is to protect uh, our, our communications from adversaries. What about Bitcoin in this context? Well, I, I think Bitcoin is a, is a very clever idea. It's a brilliant idea. Uh, people tried for many years to try to come up with digital money architectures that would, that would be workable. I remember David Chom had uh, something that, um, that unfortunately was centralized, it, but it relied on blinded signatures to have anonymous spending. But it wasn't um, decentralized. It was dependent on a central architecture, a top-down architecture. And, and Bitcoin got away from that successfully. And, it, and it, most importantly, it solved the double spending problem in a decentralized way. Um, if you do a centralized approach, you can solve the double spending problem. But, you know, there's lots of disadvantages in doing it in a centralized way. Bitcoin decentralized that with their proof of work and their and the blockchain, the immutable blockchain. And that was an elegant solution. And, and there's lots of places around the world where you need to be able to provide some way for people, especially in autocratic environments, to be able to spend money, to receive money internationally or send money internationally, and to be able to you know, do things without dependence on a bank. Maybe the bank... Maybe they don't have ac access to banking. Uh, maybe they could be stopped by a bank. Uh, so Bitcoin is has a lot of um, has a lot of beauty from a from a personal freedom point of view. Adam, why Bitcoin? Yeah. So you know, as as I said, my uh, sort of path into learning about some of the cypherpunks sort of technical missions of providing you know tor before tor existed and electronic cash was actually pgp which i found inspiring so i find the you know the cypherpunks were considering electronic cash the holy grail like the most challenging but potentially the most valuable or rewarding or useful to society and i think some of the cypherpunks were interested in monetary reform like a return to a gold standard kind of gold bug mentality um, I wasn't so much myself. Myself, I was like a little bit more interested in the kind of uh, bearer, bearer electronic cash. So basically having the equivalent of paper cash, but in a, in a digital world. And so yep. um, now Bitcoin has both of those and that's, that's great. You know, I mean, it, it brings two kind of interests together and is an adoption driver. And I've certainly talked to people who came into Bitcoin through all kinds of, you know, random directions and... You know, once they learn more about it, they potentially get more philosophic or, you know, learn some other philosophical ways to look at things. So, you know, that's interesting. But my, my original involvement with Bitcoin-like things was um, through run, running one of these remailers, which uh, like a second revision, second version of the kind of protocol that Hal Finney adapted by adding PGP to it. So then there was a second version made, which had, you know, custom encryption which was breaking up messages into fixed size uh, packets that were emailed because if you just sort of bulk emailed the thing, the, the size would give the game away. So you know, the original version was a bit simple. And so the so I was running one of these remailers and the problem we had with that was spam. Uh, people would spam through it yeah. and there was no accountability, right? So yeah. 
So as an operator of this, you can see that using the operators are getting annoyed about the spam. Maybe they're going to block free mailers, not because they're philosophically against, they're just neutral, but they want to like stop the nuisance factor, right? So I had to think about it in a different way because usually email, even today, was sort of about, you know, blacklisting IP addresses, domains, senders, email addresses, and more recently, like, you know, heuristics about the content of the mail, right? And so I had to think about it a different way. So I had none of that. It's like privacy is built into it, so you have no choice. And so I went back to the basics to think, well, what is the fundamental problem? So email is completely free. And so, you know, boy, it's pity that the Cypherpunks, you know, we haven't figured out how to do electronic hash, but maybe I could do some you know, reduce the requirements and do something simpler that would be achievable, which to create a cost for the sender. That doesn't translate into respendable value for the recipient, but that turns out you could do with the hash cache protocol. So I was kind of motivated by that use case and that problem. And, you know, I was quite interested in uh, cryptography, applied cryptography, implementing things related to cryptography. So I was reasonably inventive about taking the building blocks and creating a, a function or a behavior that, that would achieve that. So that's where Hashcash came from. But this was also in the context of, you know, the recent demise of Digicash. As Phil said, you know, it was centralized, and I think that was the ultimate demise that the company failed. You know, and then I, like a number of people, had some Digicash tokens, but they were completely indistinguishable from spent coins when that database went away, right? So I think that caused, you know, a number of people on the Cypunks list who are interested to figure out how to deploy electronic cash to have a rethink, you know? Well, clearly it needed to be distributed because the centralized thing failed, and that's more challenging. So then we were thinking, well, how could you do it? And one of the things that Digicash, today you would call Digicash a stablecoin. They were trying to work on a relationship with a bank, right? And so with a distributed outlook, the question is, well, you can't expect that to be a relationship with a bank because there's no commercial entity to do that, right? And so in that context, Hashcash added to the conversation because, you know, within a few days of Describing it, a uh, summary of how it worked, and some source code for the remailer use, lots of people seemed to independently arrive at the idea that this was somehow like digital gold and pick it up as a, a building block to try and build a decentralized electronic cache. And you know, by 1998, there were two kind of outline ideas of how to do that one by Nick Zabo, which he called BitGold, and another one by Weidai called BMoney. And those were both you know, using Hashcash for mining. And we're a sketch of a kind of proto Bitcoin that was a bit too vague and you know had some holes in its design or had involved too much kind of human judgment and management to be truly decentralized, but it's definitely a leap forward towards that. And so I think the next step was Hal Finney, again, the same guy, very you know, if Cypherpunks write code, Hal Finney was the coder. So he implemented RPAL, which is a reusable proof of work. Also, Hashcash mining, but it was a Chorm protocol. It was centralized, but it was inside what was then a new piece of technology, which is trustworthy computing. So the idea is that you can trust that the code running inside this computer is what's advertised, because the hardware itself could give you a signature of what code it's running. And if you assume it's tamper resistant, and that the person running the code is not colluding with the manufacturer, then it's a kind of proxy for being able to trust a piece of code. So he implemented this and he ran it, but you know, it didn't have, it was kind of a, an experiment, prototype, a demo, because it didn't have any, um, any kind of scarcity concept. You know, you would just send it some work and it would send you some coins and you could respend them and that was it. So, you know, there were definitely people trying to figure out the gaps and how to complete a design. And I think, you know, if any of those guys had figured out you know, how to make it work, they would have rushed off and implemented it because that, that was the mindset, right? Write code, make it available. This was a very sexy piece of technology that everybody was excited about, but you know, nobody quite managed to make it work until how finished sorry, until until Satoshi, you know, released uh, Bitcoin onto the scene. You know, nobody had heard from him before. I, I think I got one of the first emails, but probably the first email. And it didn't occur to me at the time that it was a pseudonym, in fact. You know, if you have open source software, people write to you infrequently and you know, say they're using it or ask a question. So it was just that kind of interaction. So anyway, it turned out that he had solved you know, the missing problems and just got on and implemented it without pre-announcement. So, and here we are, you know, 15 years later or something, right? It, I, I like this idea that um, he released it uh, with no pre-announcement. 
Uh, and, you know, that's what I did with PGP also. <laughs> Let the code do the talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs>